Welcome to the Lockjack School of Business, Business Roundtable, episode number seven. Our topic for today's session is connectivity, transport, and trade for global positioning. My name is Vernon Henry, your moderator for this afternoon's proceedings. I am, all, I am an adjunct faculty at Lockjack, GSB, and managing director of Purchasing and Materials Management Solutions Limited. I have with me today a panel comprising individuals who have distinguished themselves in areas that are relevant to our topic and who are well equipped to provide us with very enlightening and interesting discussions. Before we get to them, um, let me just say that in the Caribbean, we have some advantages coming from our proximity to the Americas, particularly the US and Canadian markets. We are strategically placed in relation to the east-west trade route, which passes through the Panama Canal and the north-south route between South America and North America. We also have good shipping routes across the Atlantic to the UK and the EU. Our geographical positions, position promotes connectivity, and trade. However, we need to ask ourselves, how does the fact that what we are dealing with is a conglomerate of states that spread across the Caribbean basin, how does that affect our ability to trade globally? How are we positioned to comply with regulations concerning the management of our carbon footprint? How do we ensure a bright future for trade in the Caribbean? Trade in the Caribbean, we know, is very important to us for job creation, for foreign exchange, and also for the development of the economy. These are some of the areas that our panel members are waiting equally, eagerly to address. I will bring them on board by first introducing them. We have Vivian Rambarat Parasam, Assistant Professor, UTT. Vivian is an attorney of law with over 25 years experience in maritime law, international environmental law, corporate governance, and commercial law. Vivian completed an undergraduate degree at the University of the West Indies and studied for an LLM and a Magister Juris at the IMO International Maritime Law Institute. She has been affiliated with the University of Trinidad and Tobago since 2007 and joined the full-time faculty of the Center for Maritime and Ocean Studies in 2008. During this time, she has developed degrees and courses that are specifically designed to fuel development of local and regional maritime industry. Prior to joining UTT, Vivian spent nine years as a researcher, principal investigator, and eventually officer in charge of the legal and policy research program at the Institute of Marine Affairs. Vivian also spent three years in the business, energy, and tax practice area of the Lex Monday law firm of M. Hamill Smith and Company. During the span of her career, Vivian has frequently and successfully manage major commercial and academic projects. Vivian's primary area of research include blue economy initiatives, climate action, maritime border security, maritime surveillance, and, and determining methods to overcome legal, 
and institutional challenges to maritime regulatory reform in the Caribbean Commonwealth. Vivian, Vivian is the director and head of the MTCC Caribbean. I next introduce you to Mr. Sean Rampasad. Sean Rampasad in three words, passionate, visionary, innovative. As CEO of Ramp Logistics, Sean intends to create companies where the best, brightest, and most talented minds in the world can find a home and belong to an organization they can be proud of. Under his leadership, the company has established a clear focus on research and development, process efficiency, and cross-department collaboration. Sean focuses on building the leaders of tomorrow by motivating and connecting with millennials. He is determined to challenge the youth to fulfill their truest potential. He facilitates the growth of his team by providing opportunities for them to shine. Using his affiliations with different boards and organizations, he promotes capacity building and the development of local content. Apart from community development, Sean is a huge advocate for the advancement of the regional economy. He believes in building strong and profitable businesses to fortify the Caribbean's position in global markets. Through collaboration, Sean believes that the regional business sector can be fit to compete on the world stage. Creating strong ties with the Caribbean community is a cause Sean continues to champion. Sean believes in utilizing resources and incorporating technology to stay ahead of current trends. Pushing boundaries and challenging the norm is the Sean Rambasad way. We have with us also Mr. Vinish Dindia, Managing Director of Vista Trading and Logistics, Guyana Incorporated. Vinish Dindial has been in log the logistics field for over 23 years, managing the family company in Trinidad and then over the past two years in Guyana. His areas of experience include providing logistics solutions in the petrochemical, manufacturing, and oil and gas sectors. He has been a consultant in logistics and material handling solution for companies within the Caribbean and South America. He has also expanded the family business to Guyana, where he currently manages a 3PL logistics company and has been an adjunct lecturer at Lockjack since 2019. And last but not least, I introduce you to Juan Carlos Croston, Vice President of Marketing and Corporate Affairs Manzanillo International Terminal, Panama. Juan is Vice President of Marketing and Corporate Affairs with Manzanillo International Terminal, Panama. In this role, he is responsible for commercial and business development strategies and the company's social responsibility and sustainability initiative. Previously, he worked on board Panamax type vessels. He joined MIT Panama in 2004. He was named vice president of the marketing in January 2008 and stepped into his current role since 2016. He's an active member of the Maritime Chamber of Panama, the shipping, the Caribbean Shipping Association and other local and international organizations. In July 2014, he was granted Distinguished Alumni Award by the International Maritime University of Panama. And in 2015, was named by Lloyd's List in the Next Generation 2015 list of worldwide maritime leaders. 
and was the only one from Latin America. He holds a BSc in nautical engineering from the former Nautical School of Panama and a MSc in maritime affairs from World University, Malmo, Sweden. Special welcome to our panelists. Um, just a little note on how we would be going forward. Um, I would invite each of you to give us your perspective in, in about three minutes or so, and then we will move on to the roundtable discussion. To the audience out there, welcome once again to our roundtable. And you're invited to post your questions, which would be addressed during the roundtable discussion and also during the special question and answer segment that we are going to have towards the end of this session. So I now invite our panelists to give us their perspectives, starting with Vivian. Thank you, Henry, and thank you, Vinan, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I would like to start off this morning's proceedings in terms of contextualizing the concept of development. So while we are talking about trade and connectivity and the opportunities of the proximity to the Panama Canal, I think all of that has to be premised on the current global crisis that is occurring. We are facing a climate crisis. And in dealing with that climate crisis, every aspect of our operations and every aspect of our development need to re reflect ideologies of the blue economy, of um, sustainability and green economy paradigms. And as a, the Caribbean region, some countries are more um, successful than others in incorporating and progressing the agenda for sustainability. In terms of the maritime sector and in terms of trade facilitation, the region has a long way to go. And I believe there's a lot of opportunities that even climate financing, and if we're able to access climate financing, may open opportunities for our ports, for our ship operators, and our trade facilitators and our mm -hmm. logistics providers to really harness the opportunity and create the maritime ecosystem that will truly drive us into sustainability, into a new world and into um, a future that we are exemplars in terms of how we trade and how we exist and how we thrive. So I would like to see the discussions this morning moving away from conventional approaches to development. And I am sure these conventional approaches will also um, you know, reflect on some of the challenges, but I will also like us to reflect on the opportunities that exist as small island states and as emerging economies in the international stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Vivian. And I, I like the idea of, um, you know, moving away from just the traditional approaches that we have, um, thinking out of the box and looking for opportunities that, you know, can put us ahead of the game. Um, I would now invite uh, Sean. I thank you very much, Vernon. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And many thanks to Otto Lockjaw Graduate School of Business for having me. Hey, Vernon, you know, when we talk about the, the, the topics of connectivity and trade and so on, what I'm thinking about is really the young entrepreneurs in this country who are starting off businesses today and the challenges that they face. And when my dad started this business in 1985 and every other person in the Caribbean started business, one of the biggest challenges that we had as a region is the fact that we were geographically disadvantaged because of the size of the markets that we were operating in. And Vivian talked about the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on the region. And there's a lot of talk in the region about how the Caribbean is going to recover as a region. 
But there's also so much opportunity that this pandemic is bringing to us in terms of accessing customers on a digital platform. And what digital does is that it really equalizes that divide. And th that geographical disadvantage that we have before is becoming less and less because we can access customers online and we could deliver goods to them from the Caribbean to wherever they are in the world if we, are, if we develop our distribution channels online. But getting the sale online or getting the sales on the digital platform is only half of the equation. The other half of that equation is the whole idea of connectivity and trade and the supply chain that allows us to deliver a product or a service from here in the Caribbean to a global customer base. And today, I really hope that we are also going to focus on what we as a region need to do to ensure that we bolster our supply chains, especially the export supply chain, to access customers from around the world, uh, earn some hard currency, and to really build a better country that we could all live in, or a better region that we could all live in. Thank you, Sean. And indeed, with the um, the COVID nineteen has the crisis it has brought on us has also brought opportunities. And I remember very early in my career, one of the senior managers telling me he said, "You know, whenever there's an upheaval in the economy, there are also opportunities." And we must find ways in which we can take advantage of those opportunities. So it'd be very interesting as we go forward to really speak more to this particular um, area. Um, Vinush? Hi, good, good day to the attendees and fellow panelists. Um, most of the, the topics that my colleagues would have discussed and touched on are uh, very much the topics that I think are relevant uh, towards the recovery of both the economy within the region itself from a regional perspective. Uh, as one of my colleagues would have mentioned, uh, being small island states, we came into it as a disadvantage. But once there, there can be that level of connectivity, the ease of doing business, the use of electronic data interchange to help reduce the lags at port facilities within the Caribbean and also from the countries, the regional um, stalwarts in the Caribbean who have been able to support manufacturing and also uh, diversifying their economy itself, we can help to further bolster regional trade. Uh, some of the areas also, I think that our strengths are in the Caribbean itself and with our colleague in Panama is the available maritime service sector, the maritime service sector and areas in which we could further develop it, um, especially in countries such as Trinidad, where they're diversifying the economy at this point in time. And also with regard to global sustainable logistics, where consumers now have, they're very much aware based on the, the climate change and global impact. And these are some of the areas I think that as a region and with the, the, uh, my, the mindset that we're heading in that these are the areas that we could then put a develop and discuss in the round, at the round table. Okay, hey, thank you very much, um, you know, certainly we have to, um, I don't think anybody will argue with you in terms of having to do something to increase our efficiency and, um, you know, working on our supply chain to ensure that we become um, more competitive um, and efficiency using um, EDI, as you mentioned, um, and the whole digitalization process or digitalization of our processes, you know, uh, some of the things that will get us there. So I think that, um, you know, so far we, we really speaking in tandem, you know, when you listen to Sean, listen to Vivian. So I am very, very, um, interested in one colors. So Juan, can you give us your perspective? Thank you for the invitation. The Korean Shipping Association is very delighted to be here. Um, we are very happy to see the webinar uh, addressing Reno approach. Um, Reno approach allow us to feel less the pain when we feel that we have so many constraints because we feel we can see that uh, brothers and sisters in the region are going through some sort of the same conflicts. Uh, so that probably lessens the pain a little bit, 
but it also allows us to share best practices and, and discuss a way to move forward in a way that our, our, our fellow citizens in the Caribbean and, and countries and, and territories have already developed. So that's the first thing that sharing best practices, it's a very good way of moving forward in a regional way. The second thing is that um, the, uh, the transportation industry in general and the maritime industry in particular are going through a huge transformation process. Um, the, the carbonization, this energy transformation happened 100 years ago and we probably won't be for the next ones. We have to enjoy this part. And there, this opens huge opportunities for a region to be uh, providers of services for these ships, whatever this new energy is, uh, is there. Um, and it's gonna open also new trading opportunities. And also on the digital, digitalization front, uh, you know, we just talked to some experts on, on, on private equity and they say that there are huge flows of, of capital going to startups and companies that are, are focusing on trade facilitation. So I don't think that this webinar will come, could come in a better time to discuss uh, opportunities. Uh, it, it, it's very important for the private sector uh, academia, trade organizations, companies to defend the, uh, the advances that have happened on the government sector in trade practices during this pandemic. We cannot allow this to come back. Uh, and also, we have to make sure that, the, uh, that moving forward, we can find champions in these governments to push forward new practices. So this is very important as, as we progress. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Juan. Um, yes, so we have to ensure that, you know, as, as Juan would have mentioned there, that it's not only the government, very often, you know, we hear people talk about the government needs to do this and the government needs to do that. And I'm very happy to, to hear you talk, Juan, about um, academia and the private sector working together and working together with the government to ensure that we can come up with new ways of doing things and really take advantage of the opportunities that are being thrown up as our economy has been disrupted by all the things that are happening, not only um, in terms of the, the, the virus, but also in terms of technological development. You know, that has been happening before the, the virus came. And those technological developments um, would have had a way of bringing those opportunities and to some extent, as Sean would have mentioned, um, sort of evening out the, the play field by giving smaller players a great opportunity through the digital aspects. All right, so let us now move into our roundtable sessions where we will have some discussion on the various um, topics. Now, I let me just throw this question to you. What do you see as the critical success factors for improvement of trade enablement in the Caribbean? So any one of you can uh, jump in and answer that, as well as, you know, give response to or additional information on what would have been said. Uh, I, I could start off there, but to tell you that uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in the Caribbean is the ease of doing business. I feel that a lot of people talk about infrastructure developments and digitization and so on, and that is coming and it is there in a lot of places and different countries have achieved it to different extents. But the real challenge, especially in a place like Trinidad and Tobago, is the ease of doing business. At the end of the day, trade and connectivity allows businesses and entrepreneurs to, to ship out uh, goods to their customers and to receive goods from their suppliers. And trade and connectivity doesn't just start with the ship coming into the country. Uh, the, the real supply chain ends only when that cargo or that raw material is gets to the actual user of it. And that whole process of, from the time we... We, we, we order materials, the ease of which we get foreign exchange. One of the good things I, I, I will tell you, and, and especially I think the region, I mean, and, uh, and one may have, a, may have a view on it as well. I think that the Caribbean region has fared a little better than most uh, when it comes to supply chain issues 
in terms of our access and connectivity to our main customer, which is really North America, right? I mean, if you think about a lot of the, in, in the Southern Caribbean from St. Lucia coming down, a huge amount of the connectivity is really from, is, the, is South Florida. And that South Florida to the Caribbean shipping rates may have gone up by about 10, 15%. But China to, to, to the West Coast of the United States has gone up by three, 400%. So as a region, there are some things that 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 hasn't you know that we fared better on. But when it comes to dealing with customs, dealing with the regulatory bodies and the regulatory agencies, and how quickly we can get things off of the port and the airport, we still have a long, long way to go when it comes to that. Hey, um, thank you, Sean. I, I see, like uh, Vivian, you want? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to, you know. Uh, Sean made some remarkable points, and I think, you know, as a consumer and as a resident of the region, I need to thank Sean and Vinush for the excellent job they did and maintaining the supply to the region amidst global supply chain disruption. I mean, we were seeing videos, we were seeing news coming across the world where there were serious disruptions, empty supermarket shelves, and I think at the height of our hoarding in Trinidad, our supply chain kept up. And that is testimony to the level and the competence of our logistics providers. And the fact that they do this and they've maintained these things, despite the regulatory challenges and the, the bureaucracy that exists and, and the challenges and the ease of doing business, is testimony to the competence okay. that we have in the private sector. And this is the type of competence that I believe it needs to be harnessed in terms of taking advantage of the opportunities that exist as the world and the maritime sector transforms into decarbonized operations. So I really would look forward to seeing persons like Sean and Vinush taking a leading role in also addressing and, and, and um, you know, being a part of the solutions with respect to maritime decarbonization. One of the things I wanna highlight while the region would have, you know, been successful, successful in, um, you know, managing our supply chains, one of the things that we tend to ignore because of the efficiency of the logistics providers to the region is our actual vulnerability in that we are not a ship-owning region. Less, less than 1.2%, you know, really in terms of ownership, in terms of global tonnage. And that means we are reliant on ship owners overseas agreeing to charter their ships to the region and continuing to provide services to the region. And that is an area I would like to see our logistics providers stepping into, into becoming ship owners to reduce that vulnerability of the region. Because while we may have, you know, 1.2% of global trade, it's a important 1.2% and that the vulnerability of the region is multiplied in an area and an, in a time of pandemic. What we have been seeing and what invariably happens in times of global crisis is a return to nationalistic priorities as opposed to global priorities. And that further underscores the need to address that vulnerability in terms of ship ownership in the region. It may not, I don't have the figures to say whether this is financially feasible or not. Sean and Juan might, and Vinosh might be better able, but I'm sure there are models that we can explore. And I think with the, um, the climate finance that, was, that is becoming available to small island states, we need to leverage that. And you know, I don't wanna um, you know, go into that in terms of climate financing, but I would also have, like to have a discussion in terms of you know, creating a maritime ecosystem, a, a consortium of stakeholders that can create proposals that can unlock that financing to the region. Because as the Caribbean region, one of the things that our leaders highlighted at COP26 and even the Car CARICOM declaration coming out of COP26 was that the challenge of the region experiences in accessing financing because we're deemed wealthy, we're deemed wealthier, or, or GDP per capita discounts us from having access to climate finance that other regions like the Pacific will have. So I really believe that it's important that 
we take steps to ensure that our private tech sector takes the leadership. And, you know, I really commend that they are able to do an excellent job given our archaic maritime regulatory framework. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Um, one, can you tell us what's happened? What are you seeing from on, on your end? Well, just yesterday, I was invited to speak in a webinar from the uh, Commission of Inter-American Ports, and we were talking about the freight rates and the lack of availability of space, which is, you know, a big topic right now. Um, and one thing that we were discussing is, um, you know, we don't have exact data, and this is something that probably Arthur Lockchat can work on, but, um, you know, between, this is anecdotally, uh, with between 50 and 90% of the shipments to the, to the region are without a formal contract in place. Uh, you know, the, uh, the shipping agents and, and, and the forwarders, and uh, they, they just go, you know, for the last 15 years, the, the market for uh, ocean shipment was a, a buyer's market. So the, you could, it was very slack, elastic and you could go from place to place and ship the, the, uh, the, the um, you know, drop the, the cheapest option. Right now it's a seller's market. Unfortunately for the region, it's a seller's market. And I think, you know, if we had more, more contracts in place, then yes, you will, the, the uh, forwarders and the agents and the cheapers who have to commit to certain volumes and conditions, <coughs> but in turn you could demand uh, uh, more conditions, a more stable price for that. And I think that that can be related to a, a number of other practices and, and, and processes in the place where formality will bring better conditions and more stability for a lot of the players in, in the supply chain. So that's probably something that the organizations can work on with the different players to make sure that they understand the need and the gains that they can get from formal contracts and, 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 and formality in, in business practices. Yeah. Um, and I think that you'll find that um, through the, the supply chain, not only in terms of contracting for freight, but um, we we even seeing in, in contracting for goods and services, a lot of organizations uh, do not have formal contracting. Um, it might send out a purchase order and so on and that kind of thing, but very little attention is paid to the terms and condition. But I think another thing that comes out of what you're saying, especially when you mentioned that, um, you know, it was a buyer's market before and people were shopping around. Um, at that point in time, people were not pressed to have any long-term relationship with their um, freight providers. So, you know, it was... Uh, very easy to, to, to shop around and get something. But with this situation turning around, um, the people who do not have long-term contracts are the ones who will suffer most, right? Because now they have to pay the full brunt of, of the, um, the new pricing and so on. Um, finish Jeffrey, for just before we finish, I want to add that, you know, uh, we know that financing is very hard to come in a region. Uh, and, you know, when you talk to the shipping agents, for example, they say, you know, we go to the banks and the banks don't understand our business. And uh, they, they say, what do you own? I don't know any, I don't know any, don't own anything. I don't have the warehouse. I don't have the chips. I don't have the trucks, but I contract. And then they go and the, and the bank says, well, you, I, I have to loan you a 10% interest rate, just like, a, almost like a credit card type of stuff. But if they had contracts, they can turn to the bank and say, you know, we have this contract, we have these uh, agreements with your customers that they want to supply business for you for the next two or three years. And we understand this is something that we're working on in Panama to make sure that the banks understand these, uh, the business and also the, the players understand the, the, that formality, it opens their way, the, 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 them the way to better financing and better conditions in all sorts of ways. Yeah, I, I, guys, and, and, and I agree with you on that one, but I also want to challenge you on that to say that uh, I, I think, uh, and it goes back to Vivian's point about the lack of ship ownership in the region. Ship owners have exploited the, the Caribbean. Like, there has been massive exploitation in the Caribbean with shipping rates. Uh, we, we talk about an international market where you could have gotten Shanghai to Port of Spain at $800, but Miami to Grenada at $5,000 US dollars, right? 
And the reason why those things happen is because we have low ship ownership in the region. And, and, and I'll tell you something, and I looked at the list of people on this call. And if you look at the companies who are on this call today, they probably control 30 to 40 percent of the volume that comes into the Southern Caribbean. But the sad thing about Caribbean people is that we don't feel like we could come together and say, listen, we already control two, three thousand TEUs, you know, and a decent ship is a thousand TEUs. And here's where the long term contracts come in place. All of us could sit down together. If 10 big companies in Trinidad come together and say, with the volumes that we control out of South Florida, let's do one year contracts with ourselves. Let's put a contract in place. Let's lease a ship. And we have control of that ship, especially when it comes to security in the region. And unless we in the Caribbean start working with each other in a commercial way like this to look for long-term solutions, we will always be at the mercy of the guys up north. And when things are in their favor, it works for us. And when it's not, and there's a, another more money to be made somewhere else, we get jammed in the Caribbean, right? So to me, contracts are extremely important. Ship ownership is extremely important. But everybody on this call will continue to talk the, the talk. But unless Carib comes together, unless Massey comes together, unless the big importers in the country come together through the trade associations, like the Chambers of Commerce and so on, and sit down with people like Vinosha, myself, and everybody else, and say, let us put our things in place. And then the last thing about this is the sustainability. And let me tell you, Trinidad is uniquely positioned to really get involved in a sustainable shipping industry because we are the biggest producers of methanol in the world. And one of the biggest things that we are doing to green the industry is replacing diesel with methanol. And you can also replace diesel with LNG. And guess where we have a big LNG plant as well, right? So Trinidad has a unique opportunity to participate in this industry. But unless the big players in Trinidad start coming together and cooperating to build more of a cooperative rather than everybody on their own, we're always going to be at the, at the mercy of the big players. I'd like to... Sorry, sorry, Vinod. Sorry, sorry Vivian. Um, I'd like to, on that topic with Sean there, I, I agree 100% where... Trinidad is in a position, and again, this is from a regional perspective, where we're not only isolating Trinidad from a trade perspective or as being the, the, the topic, but we're in a good position as in Trinidad, where apart from the methanol availability for sustainable shipping, there's also that availability of somewhat capital and also the experience and also diversifying the sector itself, the industry in Trinidad, to allow ship, uh, ship uh, repair, ship building, Right, and to be able to fund and also manage shipping within the Caribbean itself, we have Guyana, which is definitely on the up, 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 upswing and also doing re really well. And the small islands of the Caribbean itself, we look at global regional trade, the volatility of freight rates. If you go down to some of the areas, some of the islands in the Caribbean, you see how many smaller businesses have suffered the, the fate of high freight rates not being able to be, compete in selling the products with the larger uh, distributing companies, the larger shops and so on. But again, from a regional perspective, we need to also stand by all of the islands within the Caribbean and CARICOM, which should be our uh, unison, uh, that one voice should have that level of uh, contribution where each of the countries and stakeholders should be able to add on and then form one, one governing body or one voice to be able to assist with these challenges which we current, currently face. Uh, from a sustainable logistics, you know, Sean has, has made a very valid point, and Vivian. Uh, the electronic data interchange aspect, there needs to be a level of efficiency at port facilities, especially I'm going to use Trinidad, where, you know, peak times traditionally, the wait time to exit the port with containers about an hour, hour and a half sometimes. Sometimes if there's a change in weather conditions, climate type, uh, there's stoppage, you know, there needs to be some level of uniformity to, to prevent additional charges being added on to rates which are already very high due to the current shipping um, shipping rates itself, you know. So I would agree with my colleagues here. Vivian, you were going to say something? Uh, before, before Vivian come on, um, as we're on this sustainability thing, and Vivian, you might want to hear this um, question that we have here. Um, it says a notable trademark of sustainable supply chain leadership is the ability to transform sustainability roadblocks into business opportunities. Research has shown that, the most, that for most companies, the supply chain is responsible for the bulk of their environmental impact. 
How are the regional logistic companies currently measuring their supply, their environmental sustainability? What are they doing as supply chain partners to instill sustainability into their network? And I feel you love that one, Vivian. Uh, while I may love it, I don't think I'm the one to answer it. It seems to be a question directed to Venusha and Sean and Juan, because they are the logistics providers. Okay. Yeah, and I could tell you very easily, close to zero, close to zero. Uh, and one, one will have, maybe has a different view on Central America, because I, I really don't know what's going on in Central America. But when it, when it comes to the Caribbean, the regional logistics providers are doing close to zero when it comes to sustainability. And even when it comes down to close to zero on sustainability, any else is just like token things that we are doing. Because at the end of the day in the region, and, and, and you, know, you, you talked about it, right? Sustainability in itself is only sustainable when it becomes a business opportunity. Sustainability is not sustainable when it's an additional cost to the customer. I cannot go to a single one of my customers in Trinidad or anywhere else in the Caribbean and say, hey, pay $100 more because you have, a, a, because you have l- less carbon output because this ship is running these better engines, right? The, nobody's going to pay, it, right? The region is already bleeding because of that. But if we look at this as a long-term opportunity and we say, what are the benefits that the region has? And, and, and when you really think about the region, Trinidad is a big hub for shipping, right? Methanol and, 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 and LNG has to have a long-term, a, sorry, a, a medium-term consideration into our greening of the industry. And then long-term, hydrogen has to be the really the way we start thinking about going in the industry. And we are well positioned to be participate in the global maritime fuels industry if we understand that, because we are already set up to do it. We have the biggest producers of ammonia and methanol in the world. We have the biggest LNG plant in the Western Hemisphere. If you could produce ammonia and methanol, well, you could produce hydrogen. So I think the Caribbean can become a world leader in green maritime fuels. But it's not me and Vinush who is going to be able to do that. That's where CARICOM comes in. That's where a regional policy comes in. That's where an energy policy comes in. That's where a maritime policy for the region comes in. And that's where we have to bring people together and say, hey, this is the vision and this is what we need to get done. That is where the sustainability is going to come from. I don't think anybody can do it chirp, chirp, because they take out one of the diesel trucks and they put in an electronic, uh, 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 electric truck, right? That's not going to solve our big problems in the region. All right. Um, very good point, Sean. But I just want to go to Juan Carlos because he um, might be leaving us shortly and I want to get his perspective. Well, um, you know, uh, here in our company, now Chief Team taking my hat off from the CSA and putting my hat in the company, you know, we, we have these two different types of, of projects. We have the big, big projects like electrification of $10 million piece of equipment, the chip to chore cranes, and, and they provide a very good impact on the CO2. And you have to do all these uh, analysis on the ROI and make sure that the electrification, it provides a better return than the diesel. And then you have the, the low cost, but high impact cost uh, projects of changing the attitudes uh, of, of people working in the organization, such as, you know, reducing the uh, the documents that you print, or or putting stuff in the water tap so it turns off, or putting timers in the in the in the electric switches so the the the, the, the uh, lights are not on all the time, and 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 you start thinking about how the people working here can also translate this type of behavior in their homes, so they become multipliers of this sustainability effort. So I think that sometimes we get skewed by the big projects, uh, but also the small projects make a big difference if they change people's behaviors and attitudes towards sustainability. Okay, thank you, Juan. Um, so we, we seem to be very high on, on the topic of sustainability, which is, which is good. It's very current. Um, you know, we just came out of the COP26 and so on. Um, but I, I want us to, to look at some other things, you know, in terms of, you know, issues that are really affecting us. For example, um, we have a, 
a, a, a situation where we have a, a number of small states and most of them are island states. So we have a discontinuous um, landmass. Um, our port facilities are not as well developed. You know, we have small um, port facilities in, in most of the islands. Um, maybe Jamaica, Barbados, sorry, Jamaica, the Bahamas, um, Trinidad, and so on, we have some reasonable facilities. But how do you think that that has an impact on, on our ability to, to really trade? If I, go ahead, Sean. <laughs> no, 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 you go ahead, Vivian. You go right, ahead. so in, in terms of our, the ports, um, I, I believe the ports have, um, you know, their infrastructure is what currently caters to the needs of the Caribbean. And port infrastructure and the opportunities for enhancing port infrastructure is right now big in terms of the agenda. And this is where, in terms, I think we need to understand the opportunities that exist for the maritime sector in the context of sustainability, in the context of blue economy paradigms. Because the financing for these ports to be able to cope, to increase your, and enhance the efficiency of operations, it's the opportunity exists in blue financing and green financing. And this is what I think we are missing the opportunity. And as, as Sean says, it has to be a regional approach because MTCC Caribbean had a, a, an, um, a discussion specifically, a webinar specifically focusing on port decarbonization. And one, the, the president of one of the largest ports in the Caribbean, um, he essentially said it has to be a regional approach because he is not going to invest in green infrastructure and become uncompetitive in the process. So that is exactly why it has to be a regional approach where we all agree we are moving forward as a region towards decarbonization and taking the opportunities that exist for it. And in terms of the, the operations of the port, it's, in, it's intrinsic and it's deeply linked to digitalization. The ports made progressive strides, and Sean and, and Vinush and Juan can attest to this. With, as a result of the pandemic, digitalization became the method of dealing with things. But from our discussions last week, I understand we are losing some of the gains as we return to the old normal and not the new normal. So I believe we need to reflect on the new normal and ensure that we are actually taking advantage of the opportunities to have our port infrastructure move ahead with a new paradigm of development, not just looking at TUs and turn around, but looking at um, port logistics, greening the logistics chain, and understanding that port efficiencies and the, the regulatory inefficiencies contribute to inefficiencies that in turn affect the development of the country. So it's also very much interrelated and interlinked. And we just have pockets of understanding. So this is where, you know, to Juan's point, we need to have data. We need to have research. We need to start understanding each other's roles better to create the maritime ecosystem required to send the region forward. Right, yeah, so just, if, if, I, if I could just add on top of what, what Vivian said. Uh, Vernon, I, I feel like it, when I look at the ports in the region, I, you know, I, 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 I got such a shock when I first went to Guyana in 2014, right? Um, when I went to Guyana in 2014, their system is very different from us. They have about five small private ports. But when I tell you efficiency, and these guys have no ship-to-shore cranes, right? They, they, they were actually using ship screens to offload, right? One, one is probably cringing thinking about using a shiploads to, to offload in a place like Panama, which, which hasn't happened in years and years, right? Very, very inefficient. But do, do, those guys in Guyana, with the, even with the lack of infrastructure, were able to operate more efficiently and do more things like moose per hour and so on and get cargo out of their port quicker than us with our much bigger infrastructure and ports in Trinidad, right? And it goes back to what Vivian is saying about the other aspect of the ease of doing business in terms of all the other regulatory 
agencies that interact with the port. A port is an ecosystem. It's not just the port operator. It's the maritime police. It is the customs. It is the immigration. It is the maritime agency. All of them form an ecosystem in a port. And especially in Trinidad, and I, and I don't want to mince any words when I say this, winner. we have done a horrible job at it, right? And we are putting our companies in Trinidad at a disadvantage, especially when it comes to customs, right? We should be very ashamed of how long it takes to clear containers off the port in this country today, right? And a big, big part of that is the digitization and the improvements we have to make with customs and the role that those regulatory agencies have to do, have to do in embracing digitization, right? And, and if we don't do that, no matter how much money we invest in build, putting new cranes and building new wharves and everything else, it is not going to improve in the way we need it to improve. Right. Accepted, um, Sean. I know we can talk about this for a very long time. Um, especially with respect to some of the experiences that we have in Trella. But I have a, a question here, which takes me into something that I was thinking about um, in terms of our exports and our export capability. Um, and the question, uh, let me just read out the question for you. What comes first with regards to ownership of elements of the shipping transport system? The regional created products, or the shipping transport system itself. As a region, isn't the emphasis on Caribbean tourism as the main export income earner and less emphasis on exported products? It may be too costly to control shipping with limited products to export. And this brings me to something that I was thinking about in terms of our um, export capacity, in terms of what do we have to export and, you know, goods and services. Um, and, you know, are we, are we really in a position? So for example, we have a number of trade agreements. We have trade agreements with Canada. We have trade agreement with the US. We have trade agreement with the EU and now with the UK, right? Are we in a position to take advantage of those trade agreements and get you know, export volume out of the Caribbean. So we are talking about moving things out now. Are we in that position? If we are not in that position, what can we do? I'm not going to answer first because I'm going to give... V Vinush, you want to go first on that one? Well, you know, um, I, I think Sean will be basically going to the same response, but... The competitiveness and the ease of doing business it boils back down to and also how com how competitive are we on our global scale, right? Um, the ease of exporting containers when we're looking at the volatility of freight rates, where we could set set contracts with our uh, basically clients on the on, on a cost per unit, and then freight rates are so volatile there. How do we balance it and how do we compete in such a global market if there's no unison? or there's no governing body to regulate to say three months at a time, let's say there's a tolerance of plus or minus X percent, right? To be able to control or at least manage freight rates to make us competitive enough in the industry itself. But I'm um, sure I'll let you at it. Yeah, and I'll go back to, to Noel's question, right? Because when you ownership, you make money on two sides, on the freight that comes in and the freight that goes out, right? And here's the thing about the Caribbean. We import everything. We make so little in this place. It's crazy, right? So you, you, you look at the South Florida business with a few thousand TUs per month. And here's the sad thing. A lot of the, the shipping decisions are made here in the Caribbean. It is the Caribbean companies who decide who they ship with. But it's just that those ships are not owned by any Caribbean people, right? And that's one of the big challenges. So as, I'll say to you, Noel, like the, the, that, that the, the shipping product has already been created. It's not like we have to go create the product. Now, if the product is already there and we put the ships on, then we could find better ways to support the export industry. Here's the challenge on the export side. It's already, you're already operating in a small market. If you were a U.S. manufacturer and you had access to 300 million people, you could scale up your business, size your business, invest technology in your business, put CapEx into your business, go and get uh, financing at 2 3%, you know, and really, you're good to go, right? Try doing that in the Caribbean. Right? Well, first of all, the bank rate will be 8 9%. You're dealing with 1.3 million people here in Trinidad. 
750,000 in Guyana, 500 in Barbados. The size of the market is small. It is very, very difficult for Caribbean companies to scale up their business to that level. And sometimes when you're dealing with in a global marketplace, scale counts, right? It's, it, it, it makes a big difference. Where's the opportunity? There is opportunity. And the opportunity especially is in places like uh, specialized manufacturing. And because we are so close to the U.S., we can do specialized manufacturing in a much better way than the Chinese competitors. Is. So we can't compete with them on volumes, but we can compete with them on specialization and time to get to the market. But I'll give you a challenge. I'll give you an example of a problem I have. So one of my, one of my customers, young guys, you know, lost their jobs and everything during the pandemic. And they start this Instagram thing, right? And they are trying to, to, to sell like some, like a uh, mango, uh, how should I say, like punches kind of thing. And they get orders from the US, right? And they would love to ship it to the US with FedEx or DHL or anybody. But the kind of stuff they have to go through to get permissions to export, and then it's turned into customs and nobody there, and their stuff expire and so on. The guys are just giving up, right? So right now, one of the biggest things that we need to do to grow our export, and don't just think about the big Carib guys and so on, because they're already big. You have to think about the small guys who starting off their business today. Those are the entrepreneurs who will drive our economy five, 10 years from now. And those guys have the hardest. Small, to be a small or medium-sized business owner in this country is, is like a curse sometimes, right? And we have to find better ways to, su- to support our SMEs. And removing some of these regulatory hurdles is what we need to do to get this going. If we get these th- guys going, they will do $100 of business today. But in years to come, they will do hundreds of millions of dollars. John, if I may, this is excellent. But I think to answer one of the things we are missing in terms of answering the question that was raised by, um, I believe it's Noel, in terms of the um, the product existing and what comes first, whether it's the product or the, the transport. At one point, we are, as you said, one of the largest methanol, if not the largest methanol provider. Do we own methanol ships? At one point in time, we were in the top five LNG producers in the world. Do we, do we own LNG ships? It's because we are not sophisticated enough in our maritime research and our maritime planning. Our campus. Hey, ca- ca- careful how you use that word, Vivian. You might, you, you might insult some people. Eh? <laughs> the, our campus was created. Our chairman used to always say when the first LNG ships came in, to Point Fortin, and he realized that there were no Trinidadians on board sailing on these ships. And he recognized the opportunity in terms of maritime training. But, and maritime officers, and you know, they say there are 90,000 um, uh, vacancies in terms of officers right now. But if I may give a personal example, with all of that, there's no cohesion on government policy because this campus struggles to get a cadet ship on any of those ships. So where is the cohesion and government policy? You put down a multi-million dollar infrastructure, but there is no cohesion and government policy in enabling the maritime sector. So one of the things and the opportunities to move away from the talk, so what I've noticed often enough is that there's always talk about maritime being a, a pillar of the economy and a business pillar and a growth pillar. But the conversations on maritime and the, the, the requirements for this to thrive gets snowed under in terms of the other legislative agendas and in terms of the business chambers, et cetera, there's insufficient priority. So perhaps there's opportunity to create a maritime business chamber. And therein will be the opportunity to leverage this to get the government and the regional politics, because as MTCC Caribbean, we are part of the lobby to create a maritime transport agenda for the region. So this is something that, you know, I would challenge Vinosh and Sean, you all start a maritime business chamber. We can bring persons to there, create solutions and offer offer advice. No, I'm I'm with you on that, Vivian. I'm with you on that. I I agree totally. And and even if we start to talk as a, I mean, and I sit on the board of the energy chamber, and I'm even thinking about how we work together to collaborate to even kind of get it at an infant stage before it goes off on its own, something like that. But but I'm going to take you up on that one. Yeah. Def- yeah. Definitely, uh, Vivian, that, that is a very critical point itself. Um, 
Uh, there, there are two questions, uh, Vernon, that were raised in the, the chat itself. I don't know if you permit me to respond to them there. Um, sure. uh, one of them was the question of on the topic of contracts. How can we approach government legislation to keep business and government separate, which is a very critical topic, right? Um, I don't know if this session is long enough to discuss it, but again, there are areas in which we need to have that that uh, se segregation, right? When it comes to these, this aspect, I don't want to go into extreme detail, but there are some areas where they overlap. I know when, from a legislation standpoint, um, to, to complement what Vivian was saying, is that government and the legislation needs to be in parallel and tandem with the, the, the industry itself. And there's a huge disconnect where development is being hindered by the lack of legislation or updated legislation to support the maritime sector within the Caribbean and Trinidad itself, right? And unless we don't have that voice within that trade sector and, and the governing bodies itself, we will continue to have these discussions time after time and nothing will be done to help make us progress and to help the industry develop, especially within the, the Trinidad. And I, I want to touch base on what Sean would have said where the TUs, the, the turnaround at the in-gate and out-gate at port facilities in Guyana within 15 minutes is the turnaround in a country where they still using uh, vessel cranes, right? And the processing time, 15 minutes from the time a truck enters the, the gate to the time it leaves the gate. Whereas in Trinidad, if we get it in 45 minutes on a good day, that's a very uh, efficient day itself. When you have the, the facilities, you have electronic data interchange at some port facilities. You have the use of Navis and the scheduling um, port operating systems. And why is it that there's still that lack of efficiency itself? At the outgate at some port facilities in Trinidad, where it was uh, said to go paperless, Vivian would, would have touched on that. We would have had a discussion on that last week, where they're encouraging paper, paper, paper documents, you know, literally to be handed over to the, the governing uh, bodies at the exit gate. So, from a progress standpoint, the legislation, and, and that is more from a, go a government standpoint there where that was implemented, it needs to be in, in tandem with what level of development because the investment could be made, the port could be developing, they could be spending the money towards it. But again, if there's not that buy-in by the, the government sector, we would not be able to make that progress, right? And just to touch on the, the Singapore question, it's a why not? Um, let Singapore run, run the, the port. Well, public-private partnership is one of the best ways I would suggest to help develop these port facilities itself, right? We, we see where DPW is going in, the Dubai Port World is going into Suriname, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that development itself to see the level of experience and, and infrastructure development that they would bring with them as one of the leaders in the port, port world. Also, PSA, Singapore, uh, has always been one of the, the leaders in port development with everything from electronic data interchange to, to efficiency at a time when it was even a, a, a major point and something to be driven. So there is that resource and there are areas in which we could continue to make development uh, big strides, but we need to be able to ask for help. We need to be able to ask the, the people who can ask for help and help make the decisions. They need to encourage it to help reduce the, the escalating costs associated with port operations itself, yeah? Yeah, just to touch on the question of um, government and contracts and separating government from contracts, um, I think that is one of the things that the Procurement Act is supposed to do, right? Um, because um, if you go through the Act, you'll see that once that is implemented, we should have that uh, separation with the Office of the Procurement, Procurement Regulation um, or Regulator um, managing the, the, or giving oversight to how um, contracts take place in the, in the public sector. All right. Um, the, the problem is, is, you know, we have not yet implemented that, even though it has been around for quite some time. You know, we're talking about the Act of 2015. We are now in 2021, right? But that is that is one of the, the ways in which that that separation to be, you know, very specific to the question there in a, you know, out, not just dealing with the port situation, but dealing with procurement as, as a whole, all right? Um, 
There's, but there's Vernon, Vernon you, you don't feel that uh, I feel like you answered the question there for this whole seminar. It's not that we don't know what to do, you know. We know what needs to be done. We just don't do it. It's almost like Trinidad especially likes to be last in everything that we do, right? And unless all the people on this call reach out to the, that the private sector, gets together with the business sector organizations and say, guys, we need to do better, put pressure. And, and not just on this, it's not PNM or UNC or anything, it's our country. Our country is going to hell because the private sector and academia are not speaking up loud enough to say we need to get things done. You know, I, I hope, I, I know the Citroen is like to get just to the edge of the cliff and we do things just before we fall off. But gosh, man, we don't need to live that exciting of our life. Let's get, let's get this thing sorted out, you know? All right. There's another, there's another um, issue that I want to raise. And uh, that has to do with um, the, the free trade, you know, um, the World Trade Organization and some of the international bodies and so on. They have been pushing this free trade agenda. And I do believe that that has impacted negatively on the smaller island states as exist in the Caribbean. It has definitely impacted negatively on places like um, Jamaica and St. Lucia and so on. And, and products in terms of um, banana and, and, and sugar and so on, where we had special relationships with the UK and, and then EU. But with this drive towards free trade, we are now placed in a situation where um, we cannot compete or it's very difficult to compete with the larger producers um, where their, 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 their cost is so much less. And on top of that, on top of that, there are certain double standards existing, you know, places like the US and the UK and so on. Um, you know, they, they preach one thing and they do something else, right? Um, the US, for example, you know, they have a lot of agricultural subsidies and that kind of thing. And we have to compete against all of those things. So how, how can we deal with that kind of situation? If I may, in terms of the Caribbean, we've always had some level of discrimination in terms of free trade. Um, historically, some countries more than others. I think the consequence of globalization and free trade and access to financing, it requires that your international policies promote free trade and access to markets. So protectionism is actually frowned upon but there are always innovative ways to create protectionism and the environmental movement has been used as an avenue to create trade related barriers. So again, in order to alleviate these barriers to trade and, and, and take advantage of the opportunities of tr free trade and globalization, we have to compete and ensure that we are, you know, everyone studies us more than we study ourselves. So we need to study ourselves and understand what is our striking point to take advantage of the opportunities. And that's why I keep saying, you know, although um, prime ministers of Barbados and Antigua and Barbuda and all of them would have made a really rallying cry in terms of the shortfall of climate finance by as much as $20 billion annually, these are the opportunities that we need to leverage because that we have to make these things mainstream in order for us to continuously think, how do we ensure that we are competing effectively in the world stage? Because from what I have seen in terms of free trade and free trade agreements, you may sign a free trade agreement and then they put forward um, environmental barriers because you're not environmentally compliant. And that will start happening in terms of maritime trade more and more. And in fact, just as I said that we are studied more than we study ourselves, the European Union and other countries and other regions, they are more concerned than we are with respect to the quality of ships that will be dumped in the Caribbean region because of our poor, poor regulatory structure. Because these ships will now be, not be able to trade in countries that have the robust framework that will make them not be able to call at ports in the community. 
in their communities, it will now come to the Caribbean region. And that has been our historical um, issue where the types of vessels and the quality of shipping in the region continues to deteriorate because we, our legislative structure, our monitoring structure, our surveillance structure isn't robust enough. So, you know, there are trade related aspects of things, but just remember that the environmental compliance can be weaponized to create barriers to trade in even when we have free trade agreements in place. And, and it's happening quicker than most people think, Vivian. If, if you look at what came out of COP26, especially starting with the European Union, where with the imposition of carbon taxes, you know, as a country, mm -hmm. our, some of our biggest exports is ammonia and methanol. And, and, the, and Europe will put a carbon tax on those products entering the EU as well now. So it's happening much more quickly than most people even understand what's going on. Well, the, the objective is to decarbonize by 2050, right? So, yeah. you know, with that, there is aggressive um, implementation of maritime decarbonization policies and strategies across Europe. But what is the consequence to the Caribbean region? Who is studying that? Who is documenting that? Who is strategizing to ensure that we take advantage of opportunities and minimize the risks associated with that? Correct. Correct. Uh, and, and, and just start with, uh, to what you were saying as well, like I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of free trade, right? Uh, I don't believe in, in preferential treatment. I feel like a lot of the time, one of the reasons, reasons why the Caribbean is where it is because we have had preferential access to Europe and so on. And what that does is that it creates artificial inefficiencies in our operations because we know we have guaranteed markets. And we know that those things are not going to be there forever, right? So I think the, ability, the way to build a sustainable business is in a free trade environment. Vivian talks about what, what the Caribbean adds. I think one of the, the things that free trade is challenging us to understand is what makes us different. What gives a banana coming out of the Caribbean? Why is a banana from the Caribbean positioned as a premium product over a banana coming out of Vietnam or anywhere else accessing the U.S.? And I think that's what Caribbean companies have to understand. Brand Caribbean in itself brings value. Caribbean products are seen as healthy, as in, you know, when people think about the Caribbean, they think about sunshine and a, 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 and a beer and, and sand between your toes. It, it brings good feelings from them. How do we use brand Caribbean to position Caribbean products as a premium, just like Germany did it for cars, Italy did it for clothes? What is... Caribbean, brand Caribbean, a better product on and puts us in a better position in a free trade environment. I, I love that idea of brand Caribbean. But before we can get the brand Caribbean, we must have Caribbean, we must have collaboration within the Caribbean. So how do you see us getting over some of the hurdles that we have in that particular area? Yeah, and very, very good question. Uh, on Monday of this week, uh, I met with uh, with the ambassador for Colombia, and uh, we, we have a new country manager in, in Colombia, so we were doing introductions. And the ambassador to Colombia was telling me, she said, Sean, you know, for like 20-something years now, they have the Andean region, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, I think it is, right? And uh, free, tra free travel between all of them, they take the, you, you can pick your car up in Colombia, drive all the way down to Peru, no problems. Because we only think that you, you could do that in the United States with there in the lower 52 or in the EU. But other people in developing countries are doing it as well. And you can imagine right now, in, if I had to leave Trinidad to go to Barbados, I need my passport. It, it's, it's so terrible trying to break down barriers between us and our small countries. So what do we need to do? I think what we need to do is that private sector and academia need to get up and shout and speak loudly and demand things from the policy makers that be. So we have to have a louder voice. But, you know, maybe maybe sometimes, uh, uh, Vernon, our Caribbean attitude, you know, uh, uh, no worries, man, you know, cool, everything cool. Maybe that's, that, that's what's keeping us back. I don't know, right? But I feel like people need to shout. People need to speak louder and say, it's not okay. You know, we must be able to operate as one region with no barriers. I, I, I'm heartened when I listen to Mia Motley speak about that. Um, hopefully things change. I, I don't know, brother. Let's see how it goes, but we need to change it. All right. So we have a few minutes left, and I just want to 
answer some of the questions um, that we have here. Um, Sham says, our port of Port of Spain is carded for change one year and we can't say where it's at. Isn't that itself the tip of the iceberg? Does anyone want to address that question from um, Sham? Yeah, I, I, I was part of the, uh, of the Port Privatization Committee. Um, you know, a lot of good stuff came out of it and then nothing. Um, and, and, and we haven't heard anything. And again, that port is a government controlled port. You know, and I, I hate the idea of government, any government being involved in anything in the private sector. You know, I really hate it. And I don't think governments are good at running private business organizations. Governments are great at setting policy and monitoring and regulating. But one of the challenges we have in that port is it, 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 we just, you know, is that it is government run and governments don't always do things for it to make money. There are other reasons that government run businesses. And I think governments need to be out of running private sector businesses or businesses that could be run by the private sector. I just wanted to add to that, uh, Renan, where there needs to be a certain level of transparency, especially when it is a state-owned entity, where educating the, the stakeholders, and the stakeholders in this case would be not only the, the business community, but also the employees of the port, the port facilities and also the country at large. And that is, that is a, a, a shortcoming of the region and primarily uh, Trinidad, where uh, decisions sometimes are being made, sometimes the, 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 the improvement of the sector itself, but there's a lack of communication, a lack of transparency in, in seeing what is being done so that the stakeholders can be aware step by step or at intervals on why or how this development is taking place. Because at the end of the day, it is a state-owned entity, which is owned by the, the people of the country itself. So I think more education needs to be, or more sensitization needs to be done to assist with answering questions similar to what our colleague would have stated in the chat, yeah? Yeah. Um, we have another question here. To reduce the processing time to enter and leave the port, what are options from the captains in the maritime industry on implementing a TWIC card similar to what the US uses in their ports? Yeah, I mean, so the TIX card in, 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 that was implemented in the U.S. Is, is really primarily for security reasons, right? To control the flow of people who go into and out of the port. And, and it's, that's very useful. I'm, I'm sure it's useful. But I, I really feel that the challenge we have in the Caribbean, uh, especially in Trinidad, is not that part of the aspect. The, the aspect is integrating the port operations into customs, immigration, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Agriculture, and all of the different government agencies that play a part in getting a container out of the port. And that's an important thing because people think it's just customs alone and it's not there. Eh? And, and, and sometimes you, the whole up and the reason why your, your container is being delayed is because you have to get a release from the Bureau of Standards or from this one or from the Ministry of Trade. And our answer to that in Trinidad and in Guyana is what we call the single electronic window, which is really supposed to pull everybody together in an in, in a easy way. But here's what's happening in Trinidad. One agency say, you know what? We don't want to use that. We are custom doing it this way. And, and, and everybody tries to get a work around. And what needs to happen is we, we need to have like a, like a trade czar in the country who says, you know what? This is the way it's going to be and everybody needs to be on board and make sure we get it done like that. And honestly, we get that level of leadership and somebody says, this is what we're going to get doing. Everybody tries to do things their own way and it, it just keeps back everything in the country. So my yeah, answer so is, will, will the tick card help? Yes, but probably not in the way we, we, we need to get help right now. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that we need to use a process approach to things. We look at the entire process and we try to simplify that process and make it work as good as possible. Not just look at elements in the process but you have to look at the entire process i just want to go on to, I, I just want to go on to another um question here and i think we touched on it eh? but i it's still open so i will um panel suggests regional approach how do we get islands in the caribbean to work together and create opportunities so who wants to take this one again uh I think from a regional perspective, we already had what would be, be CARICOM, right? Now, if that does not function the way it should, we should also encourage the different uh, trade ministries within the Caribbean itself and persons who are involved in it to get involved in a discussion, as both colleagues would have indicated, that there needs to be 
that um, aggression in getting both academia and the legislation involved there to be able to bridge it and to make sure that there's that discussion because the end user is the, is the person being impacted at the end of the day. So if it is people aren't speaking up about it and not, are not being aware or making the, the necessary aware, there will be that, that um, lack of, of, of a voice. So I would say that uh, from my perspective that if CARICOM is the tool to be, to be used, fine. If not, we need to find another approach. Right. I think um, in terms, I think Sean and Vernon, Vinush, you all have emphasized the point of the need for CARICOM to be sensitized. And I think the avenue for that sensitization is really a greater and a stronger alliance between academia and industry to have a united and a stronger voice. Um, we have a, a, an emerging step at the campus. Three months ago, we launched a Maritime Industry Roundtable our first meeting where we tried to bring persons together to determine research priorities and interventions required for the maritime industry. And you know, I would welcome you all to join that industry roundtable because we definitely need persons with that sort of experience coming in and providing solutions and lending their voices to you know, creating the maritime agenda that we want, that we want to see the prioritization taking place. So I really think you know, a maritime business chamber driven by business uh, with academia lending their voice to creating that change that we want to see is very important in terms of the Caribbean region. And in the Caribbean region, one of the things we, we sometimes don't understand that, you know, these regional um, meeting of ministers of trade, they actually exist. But whether they are informed or adequately informed as to what should be priorities and what are priorities in terms of, um, enhance efficiency is possibly not, you know, very well documented and probably doesn't reach them. They will be expect them to reach. We also made a point in terms of, you know, the need for, for interoperability and communication and better communication amongst the, the various stakeholders. I mean, we, we know that the ASICUDA exists, we know NAVIS exists, but how are, are they interoperational? And this is where the port community systems come into place. This is where understanding the need for port community, digitalized community system takes place. And Ministry of Trade tried to do that with TTBiz links. But as Sean emphasized, different players are coming in at different stages and they are not willing to embrace it. And I understand Asikuda is actually, um, it's by legislation, they have to use this. You know, I was privileged to visit a port in, Trieste and everything was running on Navis and everyone was using Navis from customs immigration to um, the, the truckers, the railway providers. So that sort of priority and digitalization, Trinidad invested heavily in terms of putting in place the best tools. One of the comments is why doesn't Singapore come in here and just run the ports? Because they will experience the same inefficiencies. It's yeah. not that the private sector doesn't know what to do. It's like it's when we had a Canadian system. commissioner of police. Yeah, but <laughs> I just want to I just want to cut in here because we're running out of time. We have one more question that talks speaks to investment into sustainable practices and so on. Um, and um, they're saying that because of of the size or market size, it's difficult to make a business um, case. Um, so what is the panel's opinion on social and economic impact of such an investment? If we can just answer that very quickly, because, um, you know, we just have a few minutes. Vivian. So, I was just going to say, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you go again, Vinan? I'm okay, not seeing so the question in the chat. You're not seeing it. Okay. While investments into sustainable practices may be a business case, Due to the market size, it may never make a business case in the SIDS, in the SIDS. In the SIDS, okay. But it is certainly a survival case, especially from food and energy security perspective. What is the panel's opinion on social and economic impact of such investments or lack thereof? We only have about three minutes remaining, so if you could take one and a half and answer that question. <laughs> I, I actually think Sean made this point already in, th in terms of unique branding, because in terms of the market within the Caribbean, let's not constrain ourselves to the market size of the Caribbean. And, you know, within the Caribbean, we have 
as I said, we have created industries that were number one and the fifth largest in the world. So as since we do have a unique challenges in terms of marketability, but understand that we have three efficiencies and through communication and digitalization, the market is global. All right. So Great. let me just summarize some of the things that we um, spoke about. We talked about the need for regional collaboration. Um, we want more ownership and control of our shipping assets, our vessels and so on. Um, improve efficiency in port operation, less complexity in regulations and more transparency, um, greater investment in sustainability and sustainable practices. Public, we want to see some public-private partnerships because we feel that can help, you know, put things in place. Um, and one of the things that came out of this that I really like the whole question of specialized production, instead of going head on with the players in the bigger market, specialized production. And I want to add the branding that, that Sean spoke about, um, the Caribbean brand, developing the Caribbean brand. Um, the private sector needs to speak in a more concerted way and, in a, and with a louder voice in order to get things working. And um, maybe we should be looking at the privatization of ports in the region, right? Uh, so those are, those are some of the things that um, came out of the discussion. And I feel the next thing that will come out of the um, discussion, I, will, I hope that we all take up Vivian's invitation to, to be part of that um, Maritime Industry Round Table, right? I, Vivian, you will send me some information so that I can make myself available. And I hope that Sean and Vinosh will do so also so that we can have something tangible coming out of this. This is not just another really? talk shop. All right? So, um, Maritime um, Business Chamber. And the Maritime Business Chamber, all right? So yes. those, those are some very, very good ideas. Um, so we are now at, um, you know, 1.30, time to um, close off. So I want to thank all of you who have attended and might still be on the line, um, all our participants. We thank you so much for being part of this. Um, our panelists, thank you very much. Good information, good conversation, good discussion. And um, of course, we must thank Lockjack for um, sponsoring and facilitating this. And I understand that this is the last round table for the year. I really look forward to next year when more than likely we'd have some other round table. And I would, I, you know, I'd look forward to that. And certainly I would be a participant. All right. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,